This is part of our, and I'm sympathetic, but this is part of our myopia. Of course it's happened before. Thousands and thousands of times since the glacier left Saskatchewan. But we only think in terms of our own experience, which is only natural. So what I've been doing with my students for whew, 35 years now is every summer going into the bush and collecting wood. Here's a thousand-year-old limber pine. We have more than 7,000 samples of old wood in our lab. I gave another talk to farmers. I love talking to farmers. Um, this is the hockey rink in central Alberta. I talked about the trees, and the farmer said, why do you keep collecting more wood? Don't you have enough? <laughs> wow. Why don't our university students ask questions like that? Right? <laughs> question. and, I, and I gave a really lame answer. And driving back from Sedgwick to Regina, which took most of the day, I kept thinking about a better answer. And it is because with 7,000 pieces of wood, we can tell people how much water has been coming into Saskatchewan since the year 1108. If it was a wet year, it's blue. And if it's a dry year, it's red. And I want to point out that there have been times where we've had 100 years of drought. See those walks, those big walks of red? That's drought that's 20, 25 years, 30 years, 100 years of drought. And it's going to happen again because it's the weather occurs in cycles. But when it does occur again, it's going to happen in a much warmer climate. Now, the indigenous people in their oral history talk about these droughts. So we have to prepare for these extreme events. So the person on the top is having a good time, at least thinking about it. They're developing policy, practices, regulations, they're getting together and talking. And therefore, bang, when the lightning hits and there's a flood or a drought, sure, it was going to be damaged, but they recover because they're resilient. The community or the people on the bottom haven't thought about it. Boom, they get struck, they're vulnerable, and unfortunately, there's going to be a lot of sad people. So you've got to think about what are we going to do when we get a drought like the 1930s, which is going to happen in this century, but in a much warmer climate. So I'm just going to finish about how we give the science. And, and um, Emily mentioned that the government of Canada is doing a national assessment of climate change, and they asked me to write the prairies chapter. And I asked 15 people to help me across the prairies. Um, there's lots of chapters. There's going to be a, a major health chapter, an indigenous chapter. And then we give this information to politicians. So there's the ledge. But we also work with local communities, like the First Nations, the James Smith and Shirley, because they need it more than anybody. We work with small communities like Rush Lake. So we combine the science, which is numbers, with talking to the people. Spend a lot of time talking to the people that actually do things. They manage water and crops in small communities. So we have this five-year project talking to local people all over the prairies in Chile, Colombia, Argentina, someplace else. And I got a call from Ottawa. Can you write an article for the magazine Policy Options? I said, well, I'm not a social scientist. I'm a physical scientist. Well, give it a try. So what I said is, if you're a policymaker, talk to the farmers. You're missing a whole chunk of the story if you don't talk to the people who actually are exposed to climate change and are doing something about it. So last slide, just in summary. The plausible, most likely climate change in Saskatchewan. Some of it sounds good, so there's this happy person, but some of it is going to be challenging, and so we have to roll our sleeves up and get to work. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Dave. 
Um, we are running a little bit short on time, so we'll make this question period short. If there are two burning questions in the audience, we have time for two questions. You can come up and use the mic here or... And people know where to find you, of course, if you have any more questions. Just send me an email. Hello, I was wondering uh, if you could comment on the impact of the disappearance of glaciers in the Rockies is going to have on the north and south of Saskatchewan rivers and other rivers. It struck me that that will probably be the first major event that people in Saskatchewan will be able to ignore the mm -hmm. you know, north and south of Saskatchewan rivers drying up and return to you know, the triples plus the uh, glacier. That's a really good question. You know, I said it's hard to see climate change in Saskatchewan. The most obvious indicators of climate change are sea level and glaciers. We have neither in Saskatchewan. But we have water that's driving glaciers. However, the glaciers have already shrunk so much that they're no longer contributing much to our water supply. Only at most about 10% of our water is melting glaciers and it's going down. Where we notice the disappearance of glaciers no. is in a really dry year in summertime. Because up in the mountains in summertime, the glaciers are melting like crazy. And so we do see the impact of the melting glaciers in a dry year in summer. But otherwise, they're pretty much they're dissipating so quickly that their impact is disappearing. So the, the water in our rivers at this point is saying it's more from, from rainwater? Or? It's increasing from rainwater, but also snow. There's still a lot of snow around, especially high up in the mountains. So our rivers will keep running? <laughs> well, the bigger ones. Yeah. There's a lot of small rivers yeah. in the prairies that could just dry up in some time. Okay, well. The Kakao River used to dry up in summer until we started to bring water on only deep lake. All right. I heard someone um, uh, mention that in northern Saskatchewan that they were noticing more uh, late spring cold precipitation and early fall cold precipitation, uh, which they attributed to the Arctic Ocean uh, being more open. Is that something you could comment on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is some indication that I mean, the largest amount of climate change in the world has occurred in the Canadian Arctic. It's phenomenal. Uh, but it's impacting the entire world because of the loss of the sea ice is changing the climate of the the entire world. And there's some pretty good signs to indicate that with the loss of the sea ice, cold air can actually get to the prairies more often. So it's hard to believe, but one of the indications of global warming is the weather we had in September, that incursion of cold, wet air. They used to stay up there when there was more sea ice. Thanks so much, Dave. So we're going to move right now into our panel presentation. So if I can get um, Haley and Michelle and Hadrian and Simon and am I with you? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
tomorrow, so I hope to see many of you there. Um, and I'm, I've been asked to chair this panel. Uh, we have four excellent panelists with us here today that are going to really, the purpose of this session is to set the stage and um, broaden the conversation a little bit uh, more, to be more than just focusing on decarbonization and technical solutions, um, but also to bring up things like uh, decolonization and themes of justice, which is really what we're here to talk about today. And, and hopefully we'll inform the rest of our sessions today and also tomorrow. Um, so before we begin, I just want to let you guys know that, it, are we doing okay on the panel? Yeah. Before we begin, I just want to let you guys know that um, throughout the presentations, if you have any questions, please use the, use the cue cards on your table to write them down. And we're going to have volunteers come around and collect those questions. Two volunteers at the back, they're waving their hands. They're going to collect those cue cards for you and then come up and ask them to the panelists at the end. And, and another one over there. So um, we're going to start with Hadrian, who was on the Blue Sky episode yesterday focusing on just transition. Um, and just to introduce him to everyone, he is a researcher with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, their national office in Ottawa, and he focuses on climate policy and international trade policy. He's also a member of several collaborative research projects that are focusing on a just transition uh, in Canada and around the world, and he's published a number of reports and commentaries on Canada's transition to a lower carbon economy with a focus on the implications for workers and their communities. So, welcome, Adrian. I'm going to be back up here this afternoon, so you're going to hear more of me, and I'll keep it, keep it brief now. Um, but what I'm going to just say in a few minutes is basically what is a just transition? For those who are new to the concept, you see the, the name of this, this summit here is Just Transitions. What does that mean? What, what are we talking about? So it, it really starts with this great presentation that Dave gave us, and the fact is that, that climate change is real. Um, it's already affecting us, uh, and as Dave explained, the, uh, the longer we wait to act, the more serious these impacts are going to become. Um, he, he was mostly focused on the, the science, the, the, the kind of ge geological, geographic Im impacts. Um, if you look at the, the economic impacts, they're really dramatic. And again, Dave pointed out some of the insurance costs. They're starting to look like kind of two, three billion dollars a year in Canada. By 2050, we're looking at more like 40 billion dollars a year in insurance costs related to, to extreme weather events. So the, the longer we wait to act, the more expensive this gets in addition to these, these physical impacts. The, the next important point is that we know what the root cause of this, this anthropogenic or, or human-caused climate change is, and that's the emission of greenhouse gases from the production and consumption of fossil fuels. That, there, there are others, but that's the main driver. Okay, so step one, climate change is real. Step two, fossil fuels are mainly causing it. Um, and that, that leads us to step three, which is that mitigating climate change effectively to actually to fight this problem means we need to phase out the use of fossil fuels, both on the production side and the consumption side, globally. We need to, the, the term that gets thrown around a lot is decarbonize, or, or move towards a carbon neutral economy. And that needs to happen relatively quickly. Definitely by the end of the century, but probably more by like 2050 uh, to have a real chance at, at stopping the worst impacts of climate change. So, okay, step one, climate change is real. Step two, we know what's causing it. Step three, we know what to do, and that's to reduce the use of fossil fuels. And that brings us to just transition. Because, you know, we could shut down all the coal plants tomorrow, shut down the oil stands, stop using cars. Yes, we would stop emitting greenhouse gas emissions, but that would be devastating, of course, like economically. We rely on fossil fuels. Not just people who work in that industry, but all of us. We all use fossil fuels every day. So, 
the idea behind a just transition ultimately is how do we move from our current fossil fuel based economy to a cleaner economy in a way that doesn't actually leave people behind, in a way that doesn't make us worse off, um, in a way that is equitable and inclusive. So that's the, the main idea behind the just transition. And I want to reiterate that the longer we wait, the more expensive this becomes. Not just because the climate change impacts get more, uh, get, get bigger every year, but also that the more we invest in the, this kind of fossil fuel based economy, the more expensive it is to transition later on. You know, for every new coal plant we build now, that's money that could have been spent on renewable energy, for example. So again, the longer we delay the transition, the more expensive it gets for us. What does a just transition involve? Um, there's kind of two parts to it. The first is making sure that workers don't get left behind. So we're, we're talking specifically about, I mean, the, the easiest example in Saskatchewan is looking at coal communities where we have these power plants that are being shut down and there's direct jobs there. There are lots of families that are impacted. So just transition policies can be things like income supports, retraining, and so on to, to support those people. But then the, the other side of just transition is a more proactive, forward-looking one. And that's saying, how do we basically build the workforce for a cleaner economy? So what jobs are we gonna need in 20, 30 years? How do we train young people today to do them? Um, how, do we, how do we make sure we're creating jobs in the communities that need them? So that's the more proactive side to a just transition. Um, and again, to, to reiterate, I mean, this transition can happen. We can make this clean economy transition in a way that is very unjust. I mean, anyone who's familiar with the, the boom and bust cycle knows what an unjust transition looks like where an industry declines or disappears, and there's basically just destitution left in its way, right? People lose their jobs and have no alternative. That's not what we want here when we talk about the clean economy. We want to move to a clean economy in a way that we don't leave people behind. A little bit of history. This is not a totally new concept. Just transition as an idea kind of emerged out of the labor movement in the, in the 80s and 90s, specifically in North America. And it kind of moved from a uh, focus on kind of chemicals and environmental regulations towards climate issues uh, in the last kind of 15, 20 years. Um, and it's now been embraced by a lot of different groups. So just transition is a term you're going to hear used a lot now um, from a lot of different places. It really entered the mainstream um, because it was in the, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which I think most of us are probably familiar with. And it actually includes language on, on quote, the, the imperatives of a just transition of the workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs. So I just mention that because just transition, this is not something we're necessarily coming up with on our own. Um, this is an, it's something that's being talked about around the world. It's been used in different ways, um, but we're not starting from scratch here. And in fact, Canada is a, is a bit of a pioneer on, on the concept of just transition. So uh, Alberta next door has, has created two just transition programs already. Uh, one of them is, is designed to support coal workers in that province. Uh, the other one is similar, designed to support whole communities, but not necessarily the, the same workers. And federally, Canada has created a, a just transition task force, which has been, it's made its rounds in Saskatchewan and elsewhere to basically study this coal phase out and propose policy solutions. Their, their report should come out actually next month um, on what federally Canada wants to do to support these communities. So, you know, Canada is starting to move towards this just transition idea. The, the issue so far is that the scope has been has been very narrow. Um, all of Canada's kind of energy transition so far is focused on coal exclusively, uh, and not at kind of the broader issue of fossil fuels, both on the production and consumption side. So as we move forward, we need to think about just transition not just in terms of how do we help coal workers, although that's important. But, but more broadly, how do we move the entire economy towards a, a cleaner, cleaner economy um, in a way that, that doesn't leave people behind? So I'm going to stop there, happy to answer any questions, and, and again, I'll be speaking more about this uh, after lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, just a reminder, we're actually not taking questions this point in time, but feel free <laughs> to use the cue cards on your tables to write those questions down and our volunteers will collect them. So everyone will answer your questions at the end. Um, so we're going to move right along to Michelle right now. Um, she's a writer, speaker, health and life coach and workshop facilitator deeply committed to the health and well-being of Indigenous peoples and communities. Currently much of her work is focused on the area of Indigenous food sovereignty, climate change, Indigenous health and wellness, and personal healing and transformation. Michelle takes a holistic approach to her life and work, 
incorporating all aspects of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health rooted in an indigenous approach to community well-being. She is on the steering committee for the Indigenous Climate Action, and she's a member of Yellow Quill First Nation and resides on Peep Kisses First Nation with her husband and son. Welcome, Michelle. Good morning. Danse, Mia, Stigman, PSU as well. My name is Spring Thunderbird Woman, um, also known as Michelle Brass. And uh, I'm introducing myself to you today by my spirit name because that's the name that we use um, so that our creator and our spirit guides will know who we are. And I think that's appropriate for what I'm about to speak with you today um, because uh, this is a, a very spiritual issue and it's um, one of the biggest issues facing humanity. And I think it requires um, a, a frank, truthfulness um, rooted in, in, in love and, and guided by the teachings that I've um, been very blessed to, to learn along the, the way in my life path. I'm just going to slightly move this over the knot. So I have some notes here that I've taken down um, that I want to share with you, but I'm mostly going to be speaking from the heart. Um, in our culture, we're, we're always told to speak not from our mind and not from our notes, but from our heart and from our spirit. And before coming here today, I did ask that uh, the grandmothers and grandfathers would use my voice, use my body to speak through me um, for what I have to share. Um, so I am on the steering committee for Indigenous Climate Action, which is an amazing organization that I'm very proud to be a part of. And I'm going to be very frank. Um, I have, um, we're, I'm speaking on the panel tomorrow morning, the uh, decolonizing the transition, so I have much more uh, that I'll be able to share there. Um, but this will be quite short, um, just to give uh, a snapshot of, of what a just transition means and how decolonization and our relationship with one another fits in to these conversations. Um, some of the things I might say to you this morning uh, might be triggering, you might not like it. Um, but I have a feeling that the people who have come here in this room, um, I think you're ready for it. And I'm not going to couch anything because it's really time to step up your game when it comes to building relationships with Indigenous peoples. We've been doing a lot of work and we're really, um, it's time now to really be real about that. So what is a just transition when we're talking about Indigenous peoples? Um, it's everything. It's indigenous justice, it's climate justice, it's social justice, it's justice for everything that's happened. And what we need to realize is that the entire project of Canada has been based on an idea of, of colonization, of coming to these lands, taking the resources, and building a society. Uh, when there was an existing society here of peoples, of nations that were guided by the landscapes, by our natural ecosystems. And those natural ecosystems guided us in how we built our communities, our economies, and our families, because we had to live within the confines of what it could provide to us. And it wasn't just about us as humans and what can we take. That is a foreign concept to Indigenous people, the talk of resources and taking for energy use so that we can build this society. What it is is that we live in relationship with it. And so we are guided with it. It's not human-centric. We are part of a larger web of life. So we have to consider all of our decisions. How does that impact our families, our children, our great-grandchildren? How does it affect the four-legged, the winged, the water creatures? How does it affect the water? How does it affect our soils and the microbes in the soils? And everything that works together to provide life. So um, when we talk about climate justice, we need to realize that it is uh, a mindset issue. Decolonization is about indigenous peoples. I mean, it's part of it. It's part of the work we're doing to live by our values and our teachings. But what it really is, decolonization is a mindset issue. It's the greater society being willing to extract themselves from a mindset that incorporates empire and dominion over the earth into a mindset of living in harmony and with for one another and in relationship to one another. And so that's the biggest challenge. When I look at climate change and I see the conversations that are going on, I don't hear a lot of that outside of Indigenous climate action circles. And I think that's going to be key in this world. So I heard the speakers this morning talking about climate policies being developed at different levels of government. We're talking federal, provincial, municipal governments, rural municipalities. 
The reason Indigenous Climate Action was was created as an organization is because at the Indigenous level, at, these, at the community level, we don't have the support or the resources to be developing those climate policies uh, to mitigate the effects of climate change in our communities. And the fact is, is that Indigenous communities and peoples, we contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions around the world, but we are impacted the most, and we are standing up the most to oppose these developments that are coming onto our lands for this greater society. And so we're putting our lives on the line, literally. We are building houses in places of pipeline um, paths, and, and we're standing up for water, we're standing up for our children, and, um, and it's a lot. We're also dealing with the fallouts of, um, of colonization, of, of the whole history of being dispossessed from our land, of being confined to reserves. Um, we talk about, I hear people saying, like, let's not leave people behind. Indigenous peoples have not been left behind. We have been completely shut out of our home territories and our homelands. And so it's not about being left behind. Um, Frankly, we don't, I don't speak on behalf of all Indigenous peoples, just as all of you don't speak on behalf of all Canadians. But those of us who are rooted in ceremony, who are taking our guidance from the land, and our spirit guides and the grandmothers and grandfathers, um, we, it's not about being left behind. We want to live an Indigenous lifestyle in our home territories, and it is the sustainable lifestyle. We have so many of the answers to addressing climate change issues around the world. And what needs to happen is that our voices, our worldview, they need to be heard and respected. They need to be taken seriously. So when the different levels of government are, are developing climate policy, Indigenous peoples need to be at all of those conversations, not just in the Indigenous corner, not just separated out. We need to be at the conversations at the federal level, the provincial level, municipal level, rural municipalities, all of them, because we're impacted in all of those areas. We're all here and we're being impacted. So the first step to having a just transition is to making sure that our voices are heard. And I want to thank the organizers because they've made deep efforts to make sure that that is happening here. Um, indigenous knowledge is going to be vital to addressing climate change, vital. And I really appreciate the uh, presentation that we heard this morning and the science behind it. Um, we too have had our warnings, we too have had our, our, the models shown to us we go into our lodges, we go into our ceremonies, and we have been warned of what's to come. And many of those warnings have already come to pass. So you want to look at a model that shows the weather and making sure it works. We go into our lodges and we have our own models. Indigenous epistemology is real and vital and must be respected. And it's moot. If you don't care, if you don't believe in, in spirit guidance and the way we understand our natural world, it really doesn't matter. That doesn't, it doesn't mean it's less real. It is absolutely real. Saying that you don't believe in that is like saying you don't believe in climate change. We know it's real. Believing in it or not believing it doesn't change the fact that it's happening. And the same with the way that we receive our guidance. And so we, we go into these lodges, we're getting our guidance, but it's not being taken seriously, and it's a power issue. So we're talking about justice and decolonization. So the project of Canada, the project of North America, has been to take the resources to build this society. And um, I was making the point of, of being left behind, and it's, we, don't necessarily, we don't want to be part, again, not all of us, but many of us who are rooted in our traditions and our teachings don't want to be part of this because we see it for what it is. It is truly madness. Yep. It is taking and taking and taking. And I heard this morning um, in the presentation that, in, that as, as a people, as humanity, we're in, inherently inept at long-term planning. And, and that might be the case for some people, but I actually don't fully agree with that. That's a worldview issue. In our indigenous teachings and ways of governance, we have it built into our system for long-term planning. We don't take a short-term economic gain. We look at, at, talk about seven generations, three generations back, three generations ahead, seven generations ahead. Any action we take, we don't think, is this going to be good for my job? Is this going to be good for the next five years? We think, how are our grandchildren going to be affected by that? And that's what guides our decisions. So anything when it comes to um, waste management, when it comes to resources, I mean, that's a word that doesn't even exist in any of our languages because that conveys a relationship of dominion and, and entitlement, which we don't have. We have to be in relationship. Um, but it, it's, it's built into our governance systems to think long term. And so it's vital that we are at the tables talking about these issues. 
Um, and what, what, what the biggest issues too is, is with this society, this dominion over and taking, we've been pushed aside so that this project can go forward. And essentially what we're trying to do is we have two different groups of people attempting to share the land with completely opposing worldviews. And 